All right, welcome everyone to, it is October 15th, and uh, this is our latest version of the DIY Lifeboat Building webinar, um, a simple five-step process that helps you start where you are with the resources that you currently have and figure out how to grow your own resilience network um, in the community where you live with the people that you already know. And um, let me just share my screen here. So, um, you know, partly um, we're hosting this webinar um, in the hopes that this is uh, kind of a, a recruitment tool. And uh, so it's more than just providing people with information. We are actually hoping that this is a process that is appealing to you and that you'll actually want to implement what it is we have that we're talking about um, because the times are pretty bumpy already and we suspect they are going to get bumpier. And so we all need to be thinking about what we're going to do to be able to ride out the storms that are probably heading our way. And around here, we work a lot with the idea of the blind ones and the elephant and so this process and how we work together um, always dips into that idea of that we are the, the blind ones in the, with the elephant, um, which is a way of shorthanding that what is going on right now, the problems that we are facing and the cha challenges that we are up against are so big, so complicated, so inter interconnected that no one person is going to have, be able to have all the answers and and we all have some part in it we all have a perspective some information some skills and uh so we are better off when we can find ways of working together and sharing our part of the elephant so that we can all work a little bit smarter um the alternative it, it, which is kind of our normal way of doing things is we just argue about it and we are at a time where we don't really have the luxury of being able to waste our effort by falling into pointless arguments. So um, the, we wanna make sure that this time works well for us and we make sure that the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So we wanna make sure that this space is as useful as possible to everybody who's here today. Um, so we want to make sure that we can um, use the space well and make sure that we are all on the same page. So we put forward some agreements that answer the question about what we think usually makes it easy for people to show up and participate. But of course, it depends on who's here. And so I'll go through and I'll read the agreements and I'll just get a thumbs up if, uh, if they work for everybody. And if you have any questions, concerns, additions or corrections, um, then just raise your hand and we can cover them as well. So uh, a reminder that we're all in this together and that means in this webinar and in life in general, um, that you always have choice, choices have consequences, uh, but you still get to make choices and work um, the best you can. Uh, there's a, we encourage everyone to um, approach things with curiosity, kindness, gentleness, patience, compassion. These are all important synonyms for a way of working together and being with each other that brings out the best in each other. And an encouragement to listen first for understanding, um, which in part also means staying open to uh, that there may be things that you don't understand um, initially, and that it might take a little time to, uh, to connect the dots for yourself. And um, we encourage everyone to speak from the heart, for, uh, speak about what is true in your experience, what's true for you now, and to suspend judgment, um, to allow that a lot of times the contradictory things can be true at the same time. So a uh, spirit of both and, not either or, and uh, try to peg the phenomenon that even though we may discuss some hard issues, um, face some hard challenges together, we can still do it with a spirit of playfulness and um, fun. So uh, those are the agreements. And basically I'll just look for a thumbs up if those are good for you. 
And if you have any challenge or questions, um, just raise your hand and we are good to go. Awesome. So um, we always like to start by getting a sense of where everyone is coming from. And it's actually part of the process that we use, uh, that we're promoting. So we're trying to live the way that we work. And um, so the one of the important questions is, why are you here today? Um, what does building a lifeboat mean to you? What are you hoping to get out of our time together? Uh, so... I'm just going to pause for this so that your what you're sharing isn't going on the record. And uh, there, that pause, Jess. It still says recording. Yeah, hang on. There we go. I paused the wrong thing. Um, that is all really good stuff. And we're gonna talk about that as well um, because the process that we're talking about, uh, that, that we were advocating deals with all of those layers at once. Um, and uh, it's one of those things where as you start to unpack it, um, you use the word evolution of ideas and uh, or of relationship to what's happening. And that's what's going to continue to happen right, is how we address the situation, the situation as we understand it, and how we address it is going to constantly evolve. And so um, that is for us, building a lifeboat is always at those different levels. Um, so one of the things is because we don't know actually what's coming, we don't know what kind of disaster might hit, when it might hit, uh, um, how it'll show up here, we we always need to be adaptable and flexible. So part of our resilience is actually being able to roll with things as they come, as they develop. It is practical. It is, you know, keeping our eyes on where does the food come from? Where does the water come from? How do we have shelter? Um, but in that context, pretty quickly, and we'll talk about this, pretty quickly we understand that practical solutions require social connections that these are not things that we are ever gonna do on our own in, in solo. Um, and that means that that also is part of the challenge is it's so multifaceted, there's more than any one person could ever handle. And so as we are figuring out how we build our resilience, we need to figure out how we put together some very different pieces and parts. Um, and we come from a culture that likes to be analytical, both socially and conceptually. So we like to hang out with people who are very like us and who do things like us. And we have to learn how to um, hang out with people who are very different and lean into those uh, the, the advantage of those perspectives. And ultimately, this is uh, at the heart is a way of working. Um, it's not so much a recipe, it's not so much a, a, a to-do list or a set of, of, you know, what your prep kit looks like, um, but it's really a way of working with yourself and, and with others that increases our resilience as we move along. So when we're talking about a lifeboat, we're talking about the ability of, um, and the lifeboat network, um, we're really talking about bringing people together in a way that we increase all of our capacity, um, that we learn how to lean into the strengths that we all show up with, the assets that we all show up with, and grow that, that general capacity to do what needs to be done. Um, that means we also want to make sure that we are maximizing our ability to learn quickly and nimbly, uh, because we know ch conditions are going to be changing as we move. Uh, at the same time, we want to make sure that we are growing uh, a deeper deeper and broader social network um, where we are developing the kinds of relationships that um, that I think you were referring to in the we we need to pay attention to the quality of the relationship, not just the number of relationships that we have, and make sure that they are mutually beneficial. And that though when we add all of these things together, that's where the resilience comes from. Um, so the goal of our process is really to give you the tools and the techniques, really it's to give you a framework 
that allows to pull all of these things together in one simple process. So um, really this is at the highest level, the strategy is to learn to treat everything that we do as a series of experiments. Um, there's a number of reasons why this becomes a, a powerful force and we'll unpack that. But at the core, it's really about a way of adding mindfulness and the conditions for intelligent adaptation into how we work. Now, that sounds like a big deal, but it's actually really quite simple because all you need to be able to uh, start, it, well, you've got everything that you need to start where you are. So no matter where you are, you can start by applying this process where you are. The first step is just to um, figure out where, where you're actually starting, map that out, and then figure out what's the next step. Um, and once you take that first step, then you um, incorporate reflection and a, a sort of a, an ongoing learning practice into it. And that's going to then shape your next step. So the way that we usually shorthand this is start where you are, aim, act, reflect, and repeat. So the core of what we're talking about is really just finding ways socially to apply aim, act, reflect, and to do it in a way where we're all on the same page in terms of that process. So we're all figuring out what the next, the best next step is. We're all taking those steps as a way of reality checking what we think versus what we have. And we're actively including a, a learning and reflection process in it. So, um, really this is just a way then of, uh, all we're doing is kind of uh, making that explicit and figuring out how you can um, chunk it and the techniques that you can use at each one of those stages. And it turns into, a, it's kind of a five-step process. It's kind of a three-step process. And it all has to do with uh, whether or not you think of them as being discrete analytical steps, or if you understand them in a, uh, uh, one of the things that we, we've been trying to do around here a lot is um, think more in verbs and less in nouns. And when you start to see each of the steps as a motion stepping from one thing to the next thing, then it becomes a three-step process. So um, really the, the, um, the plan can divide into sort of the first part, which is figuring, getting started. And then once you get started, there's a three-step process that we just apply over and over again. And it's a fractal process. It's, so it's one that um, you can use at the high level, at an abstract level. And it's also one that you can apply at a very concrete and uh, uh, material applied way. So step one is starting is you, we want to start where we are. So the first step is where are you? and actually taking the time to map your current assets. Um, and once you map your assets, that in and of itself, it sounds like it's a kind of a passive thing, but when you map your assets, all of a sudden you become more aware of options that you didn't know that you had. Once you mapped your apps, assets then, then it becomes a chance to lean into those assets, a lot of which are gonna be relational. Um, skill assets, knowledge assets, and relationship assets. And then once you have that mapped out, you can start to grow those connections by, by working the assets that you have and, and by inviting people into a conversation. And once you have people in that conversation and a sense of what needs to happen, then it's this three-step process of aiming, acting, and reflecting. So what that looks like in particulars is that the first thing that we do is um, start by building on our assets. Um, there's a couple of reasons why this is powerful and important. And it's also a step that people often skip because we think we already know. We already know what our assets are. Um, but the reality is that being getting clear on the full width, uh, breadth of the assets that you have to work with, it makes it much easier to do all of the next steps. 
Um, it's easier to build on strengths. It's easier to, the tendency is always to focus on gaps, to think about what I don't have, what I, what's not in my life, what, where I feel a need. But the reality is you have more things going for you than you have gaps. And by focusing first on the strengths, it becomes easier than to fill those gaps. Um, it gives us a chance also to start to think more broadly about what are the skills, resources, and people that we want to have in our lifeboat. And um, a lot of times when you start to map one thing, uh, you'll it's a little bit like pulling the sweater on a or pulling the string on a sweater. You know, you start in one area and then by exploring that, you start to map all of the different things. So what's involved in growing food? What's involved in uh, being able to build and maintain a, a structure? And you start to realize that there are um, a whole host of things in there, many of which you already have connections with. Um, it also gives you a sort of a sense of the current state of things. What's your current resilience look like? What does your, your current model of um, how to protect protect yourself and provide for yourself, where is it strong? And, you know, where, 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 where do you really need to spend the most effort just to make sense of it? And this is something that doesn't have to be, um, a, for each of these steps, we have a deeper dive where we go into some of the different tools and techniques that you can use to produce the map but it doesn't have to be anything super complicated or fancy. You can just start with a post-it note exercise and um, just start writing things down um, and, and making your connecting your own dots to figure out what your map of relationships and skills looks like. And it's also the kind of thing that's gonna happen over time anyhow. Even if you sit down and take a, you know, a long weekend to map out your assets, you're not gonna capture everything on the first go. So um, this is partly part of the iteration then is to have a starting place that you can then come back to and elaborate as you start to take the steps moving forward. Uh, but in the deeper dive, we can talk about some of the, the more useful tools in figuring out how to map your assets to start. Once you have some sense of the assets that you have to work with, it starts, uh, you, you now have an opportunity to invite friends into the conversation. So as you're doing this, there are really sort of three sub steps to um, this inviting people into a conversation. First of all is making the invitation. And one of the things is it, that's important to remember here is it's an invitation, not an argument. Right now at this stage in the poly crisis and um, most of our social and political world, it's it can be really challenging to not have an argument about some of these issues. Um, you know, we can often feel like we have to convince people of the severity, the urgency, the, the general approach. This is really about creating an invitation and recognizing some people will show up and some people won't. And, it, and we need to be okay with, you know, if it's not, some, not for everybody, that's okay. We don't need it to be for everybody. But we also want to be aware of something called pluralistic ignorance and the spiral of silence, and which is very much something that's happening right now. Um, we know the statistics. Most people uh, in the Western world, this is you know surveys that have been done um, in in most developed countries. The vast majority of people recognize climate is a real, urgent, existential threat. It's human caused and we need to take action to address it. Um, you know, depending on the country between 65 and 75 or 80% of people check off all of those boxes. But that's not what we hear from the media and it's not what we hear in conversations. And in fact, there is such a small but vocal minority that shouts down all of these questions, considerations that people have learned to shut up about it. So right now, we don't have an accurate read on how many of our friends and acquaintances may actually be concerned about this challenge. Um, the chances are, the reality is, there are probably a lot more people in your life who are worried about it, want to take action, but don't even know how to start that conversation. 
So one of the one of the courageous and um, and also uh, fulfilling steps is to learn how to start these conversations as an invitation, and to let yourself be surprised that it may be more people than you suspect, and it may be different people than you suspect who are interested in having this conversation. And ultimately, it won't be everybody, and that's okay because you don't need everyone to be part of your resilience network. You need a few people who actually have the ability to show up and start working together. And if you can focus on that core group of people who are going to come together and work to make something happen, eventually you will attract more and more people into that orbit. So it's more important to find the right people than it is to find a lot of people. And it's a little bit like dating, you know, that there's an element of your, you know, you you need to sort of meet more people and uh, start the conversation with more people than are actually going to show up in your lifeboat. And that's just part of the process. And it doesn't have to be a problem or upsetting. So first you put out the invitation and then you need to figure out how to host that conversation. And this is one of the areas where we have some tools developed to help people through it. Um, this is for us, we call it the lifeboat conversation. What does building a lifeboat mean to you? Um, you can figure out how to host this conversation in your, using your own style, um, that feels right for you. But one of the things, one of the deeper dives that we can do is, um, uh, things that have worked for us in opening people up to that conversation. One is the fact that we talk about a lifeboat and we don't talk about preparing for climate disaster or preparing for collapse. Um, we intentionally came up with an idea that is more evocative than descriptive, and it allows people to imagine their way into it, to feel okay talking about different parts to it. Um, so we want to make sure that we're setting the conditions where people can feel that it's okay for them to show up and say what's really important to them. And in that conversation, Again, it's the we're not trying to convince anybody of anything. We're not trying to make sure that everyone has the same idea that we have. We're actually trying to weave together where do we have sh some shared understandings in the conversation. And again, just like we don't need everyone to show up, we also don't need everyone to agree on everything. All we need to do is find those areas where we do have some agreement and some overlap it gives us enough in common that we can start to work together on those first small steps. So it's also important, and I, I think um, uh, people with some awareness of the Good Grief Network, this will make a lot of sense to you, um, but there is a natural evolution to people's relationship to the poly crisis and collapse. And so being aware of that emotional arc is very useful. There are a lot of people right now, there are some people, a small number of people who are actively in denial about the, the problems we face. There are a number of people, a large percentage of people who are aware, but it seems distant. Um, they, they, they know it, they accept it, but it still seems like something that maybe their kids will have to deal with or they'll have to deal with off in the future at some point. And slowly but surely what we're seeing both in statistics and in um, anecdotal evidence is eventually this starts to become real. And we move from being cautious to concerned to alarmed. And um, that is going to naturally trigger a whole host of emotional response that's gonna feel very much like grief. Um, I think there's maybe even more to it than grief, but that's at least a good enough uh, canvas to be working with. Um, so we know part of grief is that, you know, there's going to be a resistance to it. There's going to be a fighting against it, denying it, um, bargaining, you know, trying to minimize all sorts of these reactions that are natural and necessary and part of the process. So in, in our groups, as we're having these conversations, it's important to understand, to recognize that this is going to happen and to have some tools available for being able to handle it when it comes up in the group. Um, there's also going to be a natural evolution that we've witnessed in people moving from the, what I call a sort of prepper mode 
um, into a more nuanced and broader understanding of what resilience means. Originally, most people come by thinking about, you know, how do I have food, water, and shelter? How do I how do I have my bug out kit? Where do I go if you know shit hits the fan? That sort of thing. But it doesn't take very many steps down that path before you realize, wow, this is actually quite complicated. You know, those kinds of approaches work if the challenge is going to come and go in a month or a year. Um, but if the challenge is something that we're going to have to live with for decades, then we need more complex response to that. We need other people. And um, once we start to realize we need other people, we need to realize people are complicated <laughs> and people are messy. And um, and so we need more than just figuring out a roster of who's good at what. We need to actually understand what it means to bring humans together in a, in a healthy and collaborative way. And I will say hell isn't really other people. I think that's our modern take on it. Um, modern people are hell, but um, underneath the modern person, there's the human person and we can work with human people. So um, the all of this is to say the circle becomes an incredibly valuable tool. A circle process is uh, it's an indigenous technology that has been simultaneously discovered across countless cu cultures. And it works because it is an effective way of bringing people together human to human across differences in ways that allow us to weave together our strengths. And so um, when you're hosting the circle, we're really leaning heavily into circle practice. And um, that's another one of those deeper dives that we offer. And it's also, I'd say, it's not just a deeper dive in terms of uh, book learning about how to host a circle, but we pretty much do everything in circle as a way of experiential learning. Um, so we are always trying to introduce people to the process. And, and likewise, as you're building your resilience network, all you really need to do is introduce people into it. And my experience has been pretty much universally people take to it and want more of it. So then it becomes much easier as a, uh, to have that foundation. So you've done the first two hard parts, and then there's a third step to this, a third part to um, the second step, which is just making sure that you're documenting your agreements. And um, eventually this is going to become, using that experimental language, what you're coming together is you're building your model. So you're building your, your next version of wherever you happen to be starting, what does version 2.0 look like, or even 1.1? You know, what looks like the next iteration moving towards your ultimate goal of what resilience will look like. You'll never run out of versions. You'll constantly be, you know, updating your versions here. But the documenting what you share from those first conversations really starts to create the base model for what you're trying to do together. It doesn't have to be perfect because it is just a starting point for the ongoing experimentation. So good enough for now, safe enough, safe, safe enough to try is the gold standard. And again, we don't need a hundred percent agreement on everything. We're looking on the core areas where there's strong overlap, where there's strong energy that will provide enough of a an attractor that can let the group start working together. So the documentation for this doesn't have to be complicated. We offer our project um, planning template, which covers the basics of what you need to jot down. Um, this is actually from an iteration once uh, one jump ago where we were High Grove Farm before we were the Lifeboat Academy. And um, our, our list of agreements was two pages. And that those two pages were all we needed to be able to get people on board and started. So when you're writing down the, the key elements that you're pulling out from your um, circle conversation, it's a simple level of documentation that sets you up for the next steps of the experiment. So now that you've kind of done your prep work and you've got a core of people who you've started a conversation with and you've got a sense of the assets that you're working with 
it's time to really jump into the aim and reflect. So step three, hosting a strategy session is the aiming part of the process. And uh, again, we have a, a template for how to host this. We've done it multiple times and um, we continue to sort of refine the tips and, and tricks that we use in doing it. But the steps are pretty straightforward is you're bringing people together, building on that circle process and you're presenting a challenge that is an action oriented and time limited challenge. What could we do together in the next few months to move this forward? Then you create the conditions for brainstorming, which is important. You're not jumping to the solution, but you're getting people to think about possibilities, get them excited about multiple possibilities. Um, once you have generated lots of possibilities, then you're gonna bring that down to more focus and you're gonna prioritize what we call high return on effort projects. So we're being very intentional about thinking always, um, there's something called the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule. Um, often we get most of the, the big bump from the first 20% of work that we put into something. If we can be really uh, intentional about focusing on those high ROE activities and we keep doing that, we're gonna supercharge our, our, um, our ability to move more quickly. The other thing too, is that that also provides some psychological um, uh, support to the people in the group, because it's very easy. It's very tempting to over, um, over promise in a new group to get excited about some of the really big ideas. And then you set yourself up for failure and then you're just gonna have to regroup after you do, you do that. So in the strategy session you're doing, it's uh, sometimes called the key method, um, that you're generating lots of ideas, you're diverging the thinking, coming up with a lot of different options, and then you're converging and you're bringing those options down to a small number of things that seem like they're doable, they're uh, important, and they will lead to some short-term successes. In this process, there's also, this is from something called open source tech, uh, open space technology. We use something called voting with your feet. And one of the key uh, things to be mindful of in building your resilience network is this is not command and control. Um, nobody that you're going to be bringing together is your employee. Nobody is dependent on you to tell them what to do. And so from the very beginning, we need to find ways of uh, inviting people to choose to do the things that they want to do where there's energy and passion. It turns out even if you were in a command and control situation, this is still a better way of doing it um, because you allow people to gravitate towards the things that they're most interested in and excited to do. Uh, but it's definitely something that we build into your first uh, strategy session and something that gets built into all of the pieces as you move forward. So um, the strategy sessions can be done in, in a single go. You can do them in a way where you can do it over multiple sessions, but it, it is entirely plausible that you could host an afternoon event with some of your friends and come up with a nice list of good experiments that you can be starting off in. And then it becomes really a question of how do you make sure those experiments happen, um, the accountability phase of it. So uh, Bernard Brocklebrink defines experiments as trying something that you think will work, but doing it in a way where you can tell if it works or not. And it's really the second bit. How do you know if it's working or not that is the key to the experiment? And the thing that is most often missing in the way most of us work. Again, the standard is not perfection. It's good enough for now, safe enough to try. And um, we always work with everything being time limited. So all you're ever doing, part of the experiment is it's only for a certain amount of time. We'll try it for a week. We'll try it for a month. We'll try it for three months and see how it works. So in order to do that, we need to make sure that we're setting our experiment up in the right way. And um, one of the keys is to understand the sort of uh, overly simple causal model. We do X because we think we'll get it gets us Y. And there's a, a dependent variable and an independent variable. The independent variable is what we do. The dependent variable, we have choice 
choices have consequences. So we're setting up our experiments so that we can understand what's the cause and effect relationship between what we're doing and what we're getting. And um, so we want to make sure that we're setting it up where we are uh, clear and honest with ourselves about how we think our actions will lead to the outcomes that we're hoping for. And then we want to make sure that we're taking those actions in a way where we have some record of how things are actually transpiring. Tra transpiring. It's very, very easy in the hurly-burly of getting things done to just forget you know, you you start acting and you start uh, kind of going down this path, and um, eventually something happens where you you're you're brought up short and you look back, and you don't have any idea where you are or how you got there. Uh, that's kind of more the normal way of working. So um, trying to to train yourself to have the discipline of having some sort of record keeping system so that you have a way of knowing how you're moving through the, the experiment is really important. And then as you run the experiment, um, so that that's what you can do to set yourself up ahead of time, set your log book up, set your expectations up. And then as you're running the experiment with your group, um, it's important to start with what we call psychological inoculation, which is it's a very fancy way of saying, just remind everybody that nothing ever goes according to plan and that's okay. So part of the reason why we treat these things as experiments is we know it's not gonna work the way we think it does. And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and in fact, we can turn that to our advantage. So we, but we wanna make sure that we're addressing that kind of perfectionistic tendency that is so common in the world today especially when people might be feeling some stress about preparing for resilience in the face of the public crisis. So um, one of the things that really helps with that is the navigation via tension uh, tool. Um, it makes the tensions clear and uh, explicit and valuable. So the tension isn't just a problem. It isn't something that gets in the way. It's actually a source of information as we move forward. So putting that tool out there early on also gives you, um, uh, it prepares everybody for being able to use it when tensions inevitably arise. And then one of the other things while you're running the experiment is to try as best you can to make a habit of maintaining the logbook. This is a lot more effective if you have it built into your project management system, um, which is a key component of of the AMAC Reflect process is really thinking intentionally about project management, making sure it's clear who has agreed to do what, and um, having some way of checking in on those agreements. And then um, finally, you can make this whole process a lot easier by scheduling specific check-in points in the process. Uh, you know, regular meetings, uh, some kind of event uh, make sure that you're tying it to a external deadline that has some weight that brings people back. Um, but scheduling that will help your experiment move more fluidly. And then once you've run your experiment, it's time to debrief. Of course, the check-ins work a little bit like a mini debrief in the process of the experiment. Um, but all we're really doing is we're trying to grow the overlap between how we expect things to work and how they we experience them working. And so in some sense, it's a very simple process. All we're really doing is um, being clear about what we expected, uh, you know, if we get if we do X, we'll get Y, and what we actually experienced, what we recorded in our logbook. Um, so the process itself is quite simple, but psychologically, there can be a lot of resistance because we have to confront the world that doesn't go the way we want it to. And so there are, again, some tools and some techniques that help people step back from that sense of judgment and, you know, that this is somehow a reflection of you as a, how good or bad you are as a person and um, really be able to capture the kind of the fun of the learning and the, the, the playfulness of the experiment. Once you've done that, then you just continue the process. So, the plan at the highest level is really just taking AMAC Reflect and then breaking it down into some of the component steps. 
and um, and then each of those again, uh, each of those those component steps becomes a skill set that you can start to uh, practice where there's a variety of tools that you can start to use. And that's where the deeper dive comes in. Um, being able to actually, uh, well, and, and the deeper dives are most useful when you are taking on the experiment. When you start to go and um, and do these steps, then uh, the, the different tools will start to present themselves and become uh, sort of more obvious in the flow of things. So ultimately, again, um, your little lifeboat is a microcosm of the bigger lifeboats that we're all trying to build, to build together. So um, what we're trying to do is create a cosmolocal fractal network. Um, and what that means is that we're taking big ideas and we're applying them in concrete specific locations. And we are recognizing that there are these repeating patterns and these re repeating feedback loops that if we master the feedback loops, the process itself will keep us on track. So a couple of things that we are um, trying to grow out of that is accountability around growth edges. How do we make it fun to have people in our lives that we are learning and exploring those growth edges with? Um, how do we learn as quickly as we can from other people's experiences? What are the promising things that seem to be working? What are the dead ends that maybe we don't want to spend a lot of time exploring? Um, how do we also get smart about sharing resources and skills and practices with each other? Um, making sure that we have the support necessary when we need it, where we need it. And the ability to reach out on demand for help. Um, we're all going to get stuck. We're all going to have uh, what feel like dead ends or bad days. So how can we um, have a, you know, sort of the, the help button available that we can, um, we can pick up the phone and call who we need for support when we need it and figure out how to get connected to the right people that way. So this is our system that we are proposing and that we are supporting. And um, we think it's advantageous because uh, it has a number of built-in qualities. It takes big, big things and breaks them down into bite-sized pieces, which means you're reducing the risk for any one of the experiments. You're also reducing the likelihood of the analysis paralysis problem of thinking you have to have the perfect plan before you start anything. Um, it has built-in tools and skills that make it easier for people to collaborate. Um, we can recognize where for example, where tensions arise and how we deal with uh, tensions, uh, psychological inoculation and recognizing the psychological realities of dealing with the grief um, are all built into the system to allow us to minimize the conflict and maximize collaboration. Uh, it also improves our ability for learning and, and sharing in a way that we, we can all show up and share what is important and working with us and for us. And all of these things together mean that they're going to maximize our agility. So this can be applied, um, I, I will say, it, there's no guarantee, right, that this will give you the resilience to ride out anything that might be coming down the pike, because I don't think there's anything that can do that. But what this can do is increase your ability to be able to adapt to and uh, respond gracefully to whatever might be coming. So that is uh, basically what we are presenting and what we are supporting. So um, first opportunity for questions, comments, concerns, and um, I will, I'm going to keep the recording going just because the questions might be really useful. And um, uh, I'll go around the circle. So Ronnie, comments, questions, et cetera. Um, it was really good to get to experience this webinar again because it's been a while, but I, I have seen it at least three or four times and it's interesting the parts that 
I forgot. And um, I just feel like there's a lot of good reminders in here that will help me as I continue to think about the sort of the projects I'm currently working on and the people I want to be um, including in my resilience building. And I'm also noticing that having been sort of really in this work deeply for two years, like the way that I think is very different now than the way mm -hmm. that I thought before two years ago. And it's like, it really does require repetition and doing lots of circle and doing lots of aim act reflect that over time, I, I have started to think about what am I going to, you know, what am I going to try? What is my short term experiment? Um, things feel lower stakes now because I approach them that way. So it's just interesting. I don't really have any, like, um, anything concrete to say other than, um, it's been help. This has, this is helping me to reflect and also reinforce sort of the ways of thinking that I have gained over time. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say for now. Um, and I'll pass over to Anne. Thanks, Ronnie and Ben for the presentation. I uh, have a lot of thoughts swirling. <laughs> it's the first time that I see this outlined and I'm excited to put it into practice. It feels quite overwhelming also and daunting. I feel happy because I have sensed like what I've been working on for several years now dovetails really well into this. So that's really exciting to me. I, ha I have a lot of questions, but I don't think I can name a specific question right now. I, I just know there's so many questions and um, like practical questions like, okay, how do I start mapping out my resources? And I mean, I have already ideas on that and I have started to, but not like, I'm, I guess my, for my question, my practical question would be what is like, what are the tools that will make this process the easiest, you know, like the least, like with all the knowledge and all the experiments you have all run, like, what is the best way for me to get started and the most efficient way to do it practically speaking? So that's one question. And then the other thing that it brought up for me is to create what questions would be helpful for me to have like in my pocket to facilitate conversations and support like both receiving and offering like make it very reciprocal because I definitely believe in reciprocity but like I have people I have cultivated people who are versed in empathy and those like nonviolent communication and I notice I don't ask for it so there's obviously like stops inside of me that prevent me from accessing the resources that I've actually worked to build mm. so there's catch these catch points that I noticed as you went through the presentation so I'm very curious like what support do I need to actually access the resources that are already there that I've actually worked to build for years so that was interesting to notice and mm -hmm. I think I'll stop here. Yeah, there's lots of questions. I guess, what is my next step to actually, like, what's my concrete very next step to set up my first experiment and or, you know, map out my resources? Mm -hmm. So over to me, I guess. Okay. Um... Good questions, and um, partly I think um, the where to start, I think my answer would be the obstacle is the path. Um, and so 
uh, basically the place to start is where you are feeling the tension. Um, and and you've you mentioned one right off the top, which is that, you know, there are these tools that you may not be, that you have available, but you're not accessing for some reason. Um, and, you know, that's, a, generally speaking, the place to start in the AIM Act Reflect process is reflection. And the first step is to think, what have I done? So if we think of the reflection process really as just saying, this is just me comparing what I expected to have happen with what actually had happened. Um, because we haven't set our lives up as experiments, we don't have the clear, here's my model and here are the actions I took and here's what I was expecting. So you have to kind of go and recreate that uh, post hoc. But that is your best first step is to take some time to think, well, what have you tried? How did they work? Which of which of those things that you tried worked and didn't work? How did they work the way you thought they would? How did they work differently than you thought they would? What can you learn from that? And then given what you can learn from that, what seems possible right now in the short term? And and leaning actually, I, I, what what seems possible, not in the short term, what seems possible Big picture, medium picture, and short term. And because part of this this way of working is it, it and um, I put the link to the medium post that I just put out on um, building the lifeboat is the lifeboat uh, because this is really the nugget of the process and what Ronnie was referring to that over time uh, there's a concept in Buddhism called the the uh, paramitas which roughly translates as the other shore, the other side. And there are things like not eating meat and not engaging in, um, uh, not having sexual encounters and, and things like that. The understanding is they are superficial ways of mimicking how an enlightened person generally lives. But you understand that you're not enlightened because you do those activities but it's kind of like fake it till you make it, <laughs> that, you know, that it's it's sort of putting yourself in the situations that you would expect it, that, that would feel kind of like what you're going for, because eventually then you start to become comfortable with that. So this process is very much like that, I think, where in the beginning, it may feel very turn crank, you know, just sit down and fill out your project form, you know like answer the questions in the project template to the best of your ability, and then um, come up with a mini experiment. It doesn't have to be good. It doesn't even have to be, you know, workable. But coming up with the first idea that you can then take a step towards will trigger the next challenge that then will direct your attention to reflecting on what could be better and, and, so, and so forth and so forth. And like Ronnie was saying, I, I've had the same experience. Everything gets less high stakes. Um, everything gets less uh, um, intense, uh, uh, high stakes. Mm, I don't know what other words to apply to it. But um, but it, it really is relaxing into you, you're not going to you're not going to have the perfect answer. You're not going to have the perfect next step. You don't need the perfect next step. So um, all you need to do to start is to figure out um, what's a good enough next step and try it. Um, yeah, so I think that's what I, I think that would be my rambly answer to. But I and I think uh, I also want to underscore your ability to see where you were getting a little hooked on some of the things that were coming up, like your awareness of watching your reaction to things, you're way ahead of the game, right? So ultimately that is the kind of the kind of the basic skill in all of this is um, not getting so attached to our thinking and our assumptions about how the world is supposed to be. And, and really relaxing into, okay, so it's not the way I want it. What can I do about that?
how do I respond to, how do I respond to that? And as different from how do I react to that? I have my reactions and there's some information in there. And this is also part of the both and of being able to work collaboratively. We all have ideas about how it should be. Some of our ideas are wrong, mine included, yours included. Some of them are really right and some of them are wrong. And I won't know which of my ideas are right or wrong until I try to put them out there in the world. And it's nothing to do with me, right? Like it's even though I have wrong ideas and right ideas, doesn't I'm still who I am, you know, regardless of how many wrong ideas I put out there. Um, anyhow, I feel like that's a bit rambly, but I want to, now that we've each had a chance to share, I want to, we Part of circle process that we've found is that the double circle is often the best the best circle so we've all had a chance to share um, a bit of our responses so once more through the circle ronnie anything that you want to add based on what you're hearing i guess just that we're already looking to next year in terms of what's the shape what's the shape of the year for lifeboat builders and we are figuring out how to support a cohort of us in basically doing this process. So I think it's really, it's great to start thinking about it now and to like start trying things out and thinking about how you want to do things. And throughout all next year, we're going to be having this opportunity to go through this together and to have that ongoing support. You know, what are the resources that inform your views on resilience building. Um, what is your project plan looking like? What supports are you going to lean into throughout the year? So, I guess just a reminder that we're all in this together, and um, it it is a, it does seem daunting, and you know the poly crisis is very daunting, and at the same time, like we can take these bite sized pieces and be in community with each other as we do it. So. Um, Yeah, I, th I think for me, like, you know, Ben and I went through the um, rough outline for 2025 Lifeboat Academy, and it made me feel like, okay, yeah, like, there are things I haven't felt, there are things I've been wanting more support around, aka, like, other lifeboat builders who are also doing these things. And now we have the infrastructure set up where we can do this together. So um, I'm feeling excited about that. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. share that. Over to you, Anne. Well, I am glad to be a part of this and I look forward to 2025. And I that's probably it. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I um I think at an earlier meeting you were asking about being able to see all the the you know you diving in and taking part in a lot of the different pieces. And um, so hopefully this provides a sense of how those pieces fit together. And it really is meant to be like one thing sort of seamlessly supports the others. Mm -hmm. And um, so in terms of next steps, um, one of the things is to keep coming to the agreement circles. Um, the agreement circles are an opportunity to both clarify your vision of what your project should look like and also give you the skills to have those conversations. So, you know, some of those good questions that you want to have in your pocket, um, come to the agreement circle and you'll learn a lot of those, how to, how to prompt those conversations. Um, and also at any point as part of being a lifeboat builder is um, we can co-host, we can support you in hosting a circle for whoever might be in your in your community that you want to invite in for the first time. Um, also, um, take advantage of the deeper dives. Um, so uh, as we are offering different events and things, um, take part in those. Sign up for navigation sessions. The navigation sessions are um, the agreement circles. The lifeboat circle is really about building your vision, what's possible, how do you want it to work navigating tensions is what to do when it's not working. 
and how to lean into that. So they are yin and yang processes that are, you know, two sides of the same coin. So it can feel like you're coming to the same thing, but they're two different ways into that same work. Um, and likewise, it is something, it's a skill that we would like to leave everybody with so that you can host navigation sessions at the drop of a hat. And then of course you can um, get more active on the Lifeboat Builder Group on website or on uh, Facebook. And, um, and yeah, and the other thing too is doing the work, doing your work of building your Lifeboat helps us do our work of building Lifeboats together. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. So you're where you need to be. And um, I too, I'm really excited for what 2025 is gonna hold. Um, ironically excited because I think the poly crisis is intensifying with every year. So 2025 is probably gonna be worse than 2024 in some ways, but um, better in others. Anyhow, um, I think that's, that's it for today. Thanks for the time. And um, any last words for the, the good of the cause? Ronnie, over to you. Uh, thank you. Over to Anne. Same. Thank you. Over to Ben. My pleasure. And thank you both for being here. And um, yeah, we'll see you around. Keep the faith. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.